on our Beatitudes. And I'm in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be looking down at verse 8. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. And I don't want to take time to recapture, but I hope you have enjoyed this series uh, on our Beatitudes. If you haven't got each of the Beatitudes, we do have them uh, on the internet. I'm sure, I believe all of those have been recorded by way of Facebook. But we're down today to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you today. Father, we thank you for your holy word, that we may learn thereby, that we may put it in our hearts, and thereby live thereby your word. Each word that proceedeth out of your mouth, Father, may we live by your word here today. Father, may we praise and glorify you here today. You're with us and direct us for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we come here to Matthew chapter 8, and we begin to say, blessed. Now remember, we've talked about this word many times, and this word means happy. Happy are you. Happy is not your situation. Happy are you. You. It's not your situation. It's not someone else's situation. But happy are you. You are happy if you're pure in heart. So we have to ask ourselves, well now wait a minute. I can't live a, live a sinless life. And neither can I. Neither could any man. All the way from Adam. Pure does not mean sinless. Well let's turn this around. Now he gives us what we are to be to be happy and then he says the eternal consequences of being happy. So let's turn this around and say well what is pure? What does pure mean? How about pure in heart? What does that mean? Well let's turn it around. For they shall see God because they have a pure heart. Now wait a minute. What is this pure heart? Well, I can begin to describe it to you as Jesus meant in 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says this, For the Lord, for the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Now when we're here, this morning, and we're having this service. The Lord is not looking at your automobile, your Facebook. He's not looking at my pretty shirt my wife bought me. Amen. I get an amen for that. Well, that was awful weak. I asked her about getting me a Father's Day present. She said, why? You're not my father. Amen. But anyway, uh, let's, let's continue on here. Uh, so we see here pure in heart. The pure in heart. He's not looking at our clothes. He didn't even check your bank account this morning. But he's going to look on the inside of things. You remember that Jesus told the Pharisees. He says, if you want to be clean on the outside, he says, you must first be clean on the inside. So let's take a look at this word pure. Pure is a heart that is devoted to God. A heart that is devoted to God. Now listen to me when I say this. This does not describe every believer. You say, wait a minute. I'm saved. I'm born again. Well, is Jesus the Lord of your life? You see, we can be saved all day long. And God promised us eternal life. And we're going to go into glory. And praise the Lord. But that doesn't mean that you and I, because we're saved, lives a devoted life to the Lord. It means that we're saved. Now, when we begin looking at a heart devoted to God, let's look at the word pure in heart. This is an inner purity. For God looks on the heart. This is inner purity. And there's two different uh, commands that we see in Scripture. One is that when you're pure in heart, 
you're free from hypocrisy, which means you're not a play actor. You're the real authentic believer. You're a real Christian. You're a real child of God. You are in God's family. We are not acting. We are believers in Christ. So one is hypocrisy. The second one is this. Morally pure. Morally clean. How you live your life. So those are two aspects that we can see this morning in God's word. But I want to take this pure just a little bit further. Because I really want to know. Because I, I want to know if I'm ready to meet the law. And, and I want to know everything that the Bible has to say about being pure in heart. I want to know. Because one day, I'm, I'm going to meet him. And I want to be ready. I want to be ready. How is this inner purity or moral cleanness possible in our life? How can we live a clean life? Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall, shall see the Lord. So we begin seeing that there's going to come a time that we're going to see the Lord. I want to break pure down a little bit further. I want us to get the true teaching of what Jesus is speaking on here. A deeper look at the word pure is going to give us the Greek word for pure, katharos. This is where we get our English word, catharsis. Now, a lot in the medical field, or they used to, used to use this term, uh, catharsis, because catharsis means to purge. Means to purge. So when a doctor is treating you, if the Lord wants to treat your heart, how is this possible? Well, it has to be pure. Well, how is it going to be pure? By being purged. Here's a deeper meaning. It goes deeper. It means to have unity. What do you mean? Unity in my heart? Yes, that's exactly what it means. Well, what does unity mean? Unity means singleness. So when you begin to look at this, in the original Bible language, it means that you have singleness in your heart. It's not so much the cleaning of the heart that prepares the heart to be pure, but it is talking about the singleness of heart. Now let me tell you what I'm talking about. It means to have no undesired elements. If you want something that is pure, it can't have any elements, not one, or that whatever it is, is not pure. Now we call a lot of things pure today. We see that we call gold, it's pure gold, it's pure silver. Let me tell you, it's not 100% pure. There's elements in it. They tell you it's pure, but it's not totally pure. Yes, they refine it. Yes, they purge it. But it can't be completely pure. But your heart can be. You say, what do you mean? Well, you've got to have a singleness of heart. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that you can't have a heart that is mixed. Your heart has got to be singular. What do you mean, preacher? What are you, what are you talking about here? Well... Jesus begins teaching us in chapter 6. Now, this sermon on the mount that we're studying here in the Beatitudes goes all the way to the end of chapter 7. So, in chapter 6, Jesus begins talking about the heart. And he begins to summarize what he means about being pure in the heart. And this is what he says. No man can serve to masters. It's impossible. Don't tell me. Don't pray to the Lord and tell the Lord, Lord, I want to do this, this, and this, and I want you to be a part of my life. Let me tell you something. Jesus did not die 
on a cross for it to, to be added to your life. He did not die to be a part of your life. No, he did not. He did not die for him to be one of the greatest elements in your heart. No, he did not. Jesus, when he died on that cross, he wants your whole heart. He wants a whole heart. He don't want to be a part of your life. I heard a preacher say, well, come on down to the altar. Let's pray that Jesus may be a part of your life. No, no, and no. He don't want to be a part of anything in your heart. He wants to be number one in your heart. Not a part of your heart. The rich young man came and said, Lord, what must I do to have eternal life? you got to understand this. When you come to the Lord, you're broken. You can't do anything. You can't do works of the law. You can't come to church. These things doesn't save man. Jesus saves man. And he does not want to be the biggest part of your life. He wants to be your life. Jesus said in John chapter 14, what did he say? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Singleness of heart. What does singleness of heart mean? Well, let's finish this verse. And I'm in chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. That's a statement. That's not, well, Lord, if you knew my heart. Lord, if you knew my life. Lord, if you knew my upbringing. No, no, and no. When Jesus Christ died on that cross and that blood ran down, and you trusted him as your Lord and Savior, that blood cleansed you from all sin. You are a new creature in Christ. And as a new creature in Christ, Christ is to be number one in your heart. You can't have anything else in your heart that is number one. Your money, your cars, your wife, your husband, your children that are dear to us, grandchildren. Oh, I love to fill them full of sugar and send them home. Amen? But they can't be number one. Jesus is number one. And because Jesus is number one, we have a wonderful wife or husband or children or grandchildren because Jesus is number one he allows us to be able to obtain things in the world that we need to live singleness of heart I'm going to try to get through this verse I am no man can serve two masters so you have to ask yourself is there anything in your heart that you place before the Lord Anything. Anything. What is number one in your life? Then you're serving two masters. If there's any element that is in your heart that is greater or may you feel is the same as Jesus, you have an unpure heart. Your heart is to be pure. In order for our heart to be pure, Jesus is number one in our life, or your heart is not pure. Amen? Now, I know this is some old-time religion. You say, now, wait a minute. You're going back in the Old Testament to idol worship. So we don't hear a lot about idols today. So does that mean there's no idols in our land? Maybe we preach on. No man can serve two masters. Because here's what's going to happen. He's going to hate the one and love the other. Or he will hold to the one and despise the other. For you cannot serve God and mammon. And I know you can break that down to money. But there's more things in money than, than we serve. You want a pure heart? A pure heart is a heart that is single, a heart that Christ is number one above all things. That's a pure heart. Now listen to me when I tell you this. As a minister, and maybe you've been a part of, of this in your life, I have been called to hospitals. 
and they say, uncle, dad, mom, sister, wants to talk to you. So I jump in my car and, and I drive to, to the hospital. Then I get up there and, and they say, I, I'm afraid to die. I said, but you're a member of, of such a church. Now listen, I don't mean membership for salvation. I'm just talking to this one on their, on their, their bed of sickness. And I said, but you're a member of, of whatever church. And you have been saved. And they said, yes, I have been saved. I said, are you sure? They said, yes, I have been saved. And I said, well, why are you so fearful? Because my Bible says that when you accept Christ as your Savior, there is no fear of death. Where is thy sting, O death, David said. There is no fear. So I I'm confused because I'm asking them, and I'm saying, well, why are you so fearful? And I thought maybe they didn't want to leave loved ones behind. Maybe they wanted to finish their career. Maybe they wanted to finish school. And I said, well, why are you so fearful? And they said, because of the way I live my life, I'm not ready to meet the Lord. Here is a, a man or a woman that is telling me that they love the Lord. Yet they're fearful of dying because of the way they live their life on earth. Don't be this individual. Be pure in heart, Jesus said. Now, let me ask you. And I think if you went around the world and took this survey, I think you would be surprised. How many people do you think that you would run into? They say, oh, yes, I've been saved. And maybe they are. Yet. You ask them, so are you ready to go and meet the Lord today if it would be? No, no, I'm not ready for that. Well, that's confusing. If Jesus spilled his blood on the crucifixion of the cross, and he died for me, and he is my life, then why would I not want to go see him? Why would I be fearful? Unless my heart was not pure. Let's get into this word a little bit further and pure. So how does a believer have a pure heart? Well, not only are they saved, that's the first step. <laughs> There's no way that you can even have a heart that, that God even recognizes without being saved. But when you begin living that Christian life, the devil, as soon as you are saved, he's going to show up on your church steps, on your doorsteps, He's going to show up somehow on the telephone, uh, by, by uh, media, somehow, some way, somebody's going to show up, and, 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 and you're going to be under attack because you just got rid of your old earthly father, that, that old devil, and, and you have accepted Christ, and, and now you have a real father, and you've been adopted into the family of God. So be prepared. It's going, he's going to come after you somehow. Well, what is the pure in heart? The pure in heart is those that has a life that's devoted to the Lord. What do you mean? They don't go to work. They just sit home and read their Bible all day. No, that's not what that means. Praise the Lord if you're able to do that. But that's not what that means. It means that number one in your heart is God above all things. Above all things. That's the pure in heart. A believer that devotes their life to the Lord, heart, mind, body, and soul, the scripture says, they desire to walk with God. That's their desire. Now, let me caution you for a minute on my own life. Now, am I ready to die today? Well, my answer is yes. But do I want to die today? Well, not particularly. But if I do, and if it is the Lord's will, I'm ready to see my Lord and Savior. Amen? I'm ready. I'm ready. They have a desire to see God, the pure in heart. They want to live a life that is holy before God. 
We know that we still sin, but we want to live a life of holiness. Not out of ritual, but out of relationship. There's coming a day. Now listen. There's coming a day that the pure in heart shall see God. So, we sometimes might have to say, well, you know, I might have to make a few adjustments in my life. I, I suggest that you do that. I suggest that if there's anything put before God in your heart, that it's lower on the list than God. Or you won't be ready to meet Him. There are believers today that I've say, said that I've seen in hospitals that are terrified to die. Yet they profess Christ as Savior because of the life they have lived. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now let me tell you something about my own personal life. And this could be your personal life too. Just because you're a preacher doesn't mean that you live a life that's different than me. But I sit here on this world day after day after day reading this word. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, Wednesdays, whatever it may be, preaching, pastoring. In my life, I am so ready to see Jesus. <laughs> I, I want to walk with him. I want to embrace him. I want to walk with him in glory. I want to thank him. I just want to embrace him and walk with him in glory. Why? Because the Lord is number one in my life. And I know many of you, the Lord is number one in your life. That's the pure in heart. That's the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9. I don't know if we'll be able to finish this today. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. Boy, where are they at in the world today? Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. In Isaiah chapter 9, very familiar when we're talking about peace. There's a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And then it continues and it says that he is the prince of peace. The prince of peace. Listen, as a believer, as a Christian, as a child of God, you are to be a peacemaker. You are not one that causes strife and contention in the world. For God calls us to be humble. And in humbleness, there is strength. When we humble ourselves, God gives us the strength to be peaceful in our hearts. And I know that sometimes pride comes before peace. And sometimes that's in my own life. When you talk about peace... I want you to give it, I want to give you an acronym this morning about peace. P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace. You ready? When a man puts everything aside, Christ enters. Amen? Well, that's how we come to the Lord. That's how we come to the Lord. By putting ourselves aside and saying, Lord, I'm broken now. Lord, I need you. And then the Lord, as we pray to him to come into our heart. In James chapter 4, we can't get no further than this today, but I want to get this far because I know that you have seen, especially in the last couple weeks, our world in turmoil, our nation. James has the answer. James says this, in chapter 4. Where are these wars. And these fightings. 
Where are they coming from among you? What, what, is, what is inside of the man? What is happening? Where are these wars and fighting coming from? And then he says, Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and ye have not. Ye kill and ye desire to have, but you cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you have not. Because you ask not. You ask, ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. You adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enemy against God? Whosoever will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Now let me close here real quick. I want, to, I want three small points. I'm going to show you what you've been seeing in our nation. This is what you have been seeing. There's three wars in this passage. Three wars. James just mentioned. There's war on the outside. Man fighting against each other. Politically, socially, racially, economically, religiously, family. All of these things you see, man constantly fighting and warring over on the outside. And then James mentions a second war, the war in the heart. And we've seen that exemplified more so these couple of weeks. War in the heart. There's no peace in the heart. And then thirdly, the third point that James makes, which is the summary. The reason man is fighting on the outside because it's the inside, because the inside, they're warring against God. They're warring against God. Do you think that this is just the battles that we've seen? Do you think this is just somebody's good idea? Do you think it's somebody's thought? Do you really think it's history? Do you really think it's all of these things? What you see on the inside is no peace in the heart of a man that wars and fights. No peace with God. There's no way a man can claim the peace of God in their heart and have wars and fightings. It doesn't work. Well, as we close here, you will see man continually war. And continue to war in our nation and around the world. War will continue. And I'm not talking about military. I'm talking about even in our homes. War will continue. Why? Because the Lord Jesus is not in everyone's heart. And we live in a fallen world. Until a man is no longer at war with God in their heart. They'll be involved in all three of these wars their entire life. They'll have strife, contention, and fightings and wars on the outside because the inside is corrupt because the inside is fighting against God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And we'll begin next week. But listen, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, Jesus always turns man's thoughts, psychology, all of these things upside down. The world's ways is not Jesus' ways. But I can tell you this, and many of you here know this, I love the ways of my Lord and Savior more. Amen. Listen, make sure he's in your heart. Make sure he's number one above all things. Once again, I want to recognize our fathers here today, and I want to thank our Father for our fathers, and I want to thank our Father in heaven that sent his son to die on the cross, that we can go to him and say, Lord, I don't know who you are. 
Lord, I have that sin nature all the way back from Adam. But Lord, I am answering the call that you have put in my heart to come and be saved. Lord, I'm answering that call. Maybe someone here today, maybe by video. When you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm answering your call to be saved. Lord, I believe that Jesus died on that cross to save my sins, save me from my sins. Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God. Lord, I believe that you are God. Lord, I believe that you resurrected on that third day. Lord, I believe that you have the power to forgive sins because of the blood that was shed on Calvary. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And Lord, I want you to come into my heart. It is that simple. It is that simple. I pray today that you know the Lord.